Lesson 8, Part 1. In the previous lesson, as in several other lessons, I have indicated that theoretical perfection is not necessary for successful magical work. All you need to do is your best. This is an important consideration, as otherwise there would be even fewer real magicians in the real world today. Visualization work would be limited to those with textbook perfect visualization abilities. Vibration of the names and the sacred words will be limited to those with full knowledge of Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, not to mention Egyptian, Chaldean, and Nokian and other languages, and who are also professional quality singers. Likewise, no talismans would be made save for the artists of the highest rank. Thankfully, this is not necessary. What is necessary is that you do your best. But what exactly is your best? Imagine for a moment that you are somebody's supervisor. They turn in a piece of work to you for your approval, although it is very good, you believe that the worker is capable of better, and you tell the worker so. To this, the worker replies, but this is my best work. You reply that you think the worker is capable of more, and want the worker to do the project over. To the pleasure of both you and the new worker is far superior. This is not just some sort of strive to do better philosophy. The fact is that most of us are not even aware or awake to our capabilities and possibilities. I have a friend who is a writer. She asked for one time to comment on some writing she had done. I told her I would do so only if I could be very honest. I read the work and gave her my honest opinion. It was awful. Some of the situations were unbelievable. The dialogue was awkward or un inappropriate. She was furious with me and I thought she would never speak to me again after my critique. About a week later, I got a call from her. She greeted me with, you're a mean son of a bitch. She told me how she had been up all night, upset over what I had said. The next day, she had gone to a friend who was a professional writer and asked for his opinion. He apparently agreed with me on several points. She spent hours rewriting the pages. She read them to me over the phone and I was deeply impressed. She knew that her writing was now much better. I still think it is one of the best things I have ever read. I told her simply that I knew she was capable of work as fine as this and I would not lie to her to get away with doing less than her best. Likewise, you should not allow yourself to do less than your best. Many times your best is better than you think it can be. Strive to always do the very best you can. If you ever have the opportunity to talk with someone who performs and records music for a living, ask them if there is anything they would change on their last album. Having been a musician and knowing many musicians, I would tell you now that that person, they will each tell you that there are many things they would have done differently. They seek perfection but settle for the best. Across my room sits a pentacle, which I recently made. Quite frankly, it is not only is one of the best things I have ever done, but it is also better than most of the similar pentacles I have seen. Some people have told me that it is incredibly well done, but I see the lines which could be better, the letters which could be better formed. It came out better than I thought it ever could, but I am still striving for perfection. Of course, we can never achieve perfection while we are physically alive. I've heard that when craftspeople make Persian rugs, they will always put in the wrong thread somewhere because only Allah is perfect. I am not saying that you should make imperfections in your designs for talismans. Rather, strive for perfection, but accept your best. Remember, though, that your best may be far better than you think. Let me make clear, then, that the examples of talismans given in the course are just that, samples. You can adjust them as you will. Adding your subtractions from them according to what you think is right, use them as guidelines only. When you actually construct them, they are no longer samples, they need to be your very best. With this in mind, let's look at another sample talisman. After being out of work for six months, Thomas Jones has just gotten a new well-paying job, but over the last several months, his debts have piled up. Unless he can get help soon, he may be kicked out of where he lives. The gas, electricity, and phone have already been cut off and have his car repossessed. Thomas decides that he would need $1,000 to tide him over until his new paycheck starts coming in regularly. Notice that in this instant, the desire for money will cover many problems. Thus, in this type of situation, doing a talisman for more money is appropriate. First, a tarot divination is done. The result of this divination 
are very positive, so a list is made of what figures could be included in the talisman. Keyword thousand, key symbol one thousand, Sephiroth Hassad, planet Jupiter. Selections from Kabbalistic correspondence pages Sephiroth number four, the color blue, the god name L, stone Sephiroth, the stones will be sapphire, amethyst, English of Zekten, justice of God, a creature of unicorn, the angelic order Chalm- Chasmilium. Sephiroth, meaning Mercury, the chakra heart, the metal tin, and the tool, the wand. English of Chasmilium, the brilliant ones. Western Pythagorean numerology for a thousand, and in Kabbalistic numerology. Interestingly, three representations of the idea of thousands in both Western numerology and Kabbalistic numerology. Here is the sigil for a thousand taken from the rose. Here is the symbol of spare, thousand. Here is the final symbol. Here is a sigil for the Olympian spirit Bether. And here is the astrological symbol of Jupiter. All these symbols combined together on each face of the card. Now with all of the above, let's try a sample talisman to obtain $1,000. On the previous page, you will find the sample. Side 1 has the symbol from the system of spare, the number derived from the numerological systems, the number of the Sephiroth, the name of the Sephiroth and its translation. Side 2 has the sigil from the rose, the god name, the angelic name, and the translation of that name, plus a heart as a symbol of the heart chakra. Side 3 has a symbol for Jupiter in the center. Above is an image of a unicorn's horn. Below is the wand. To the left is a tin can. To the right is a gem to represent sapphire. This whole side is shaded deep blue. Side 4 has the sigil of Bether plus the name of the angelic order above and the translation of that name below. Thus you can see how easy it is to construct a talisman from the information contained so far in this course. I would urge you at this time to try your hand at creating some simple sampled talismans. Try one to help pass a test, to win at gambling, or obtain spiritual wisdom. Figure out what your needs are and then try designing some talismans for those purposes at this point in your studies i suggest that any talisman you create should be constructed from the information contained so far in this course do not at this time go to outside sources this is not meant to hinder you from looking at other sources i always encourage looking at the works of other writers the fact that the matter is that some books which claim to be showing talismanic symbols given part or in toto symbols used to summon up spiritual beings entities or powers call them what you will as an example of this i call your attention to the small book secrets of the magical seals by anna riva this book gives a wide variety of symbols with instructions on how to use them as talismans one of the largest sections of this book is dedicated to the seals of solomon as and are you told that an appropriate seal can be found to influence one special situation or object these seals come directly from the greater key of Solomon and are actual known now are actually known as medals or pentacles. Their purpose is to strike terror into the spirit and reduce them to obedience. If thou invokes the spirits by virtue of these pentacles, they will obey thee without prejudice, repugnance, and will fear them, and thou shalt see them so surprised by fear and terror that none of them will be sufficiently bold to wish to oppose thy will. These are not figures for use on talismans such as we have been discussing. They are protective devices for use in magical evocations and invocations. By the end of this course, you will be able to tell the difference between symbols to be used as talismans and symbols to be used for other purposes. At this time, freely choose whatever symbols you wish. At this time, stick to what you have been shown. Remember, one of the goals of this course is to allow you to pick up and understand any book of magic by the end of these lessons, not by the middle. Let's assume that you have constructed your talisman. After, of course, you have done a divination to, dis- to discover the outcome of making the device, the next step is to empower it, to charge it, to consecrate it. This brings us to the next section of this lesson. Part 2 The charging of a Kabbalistic talisman requires more preparation and, to my mind, involvement 
than does the charging of a low magic talisman. In common with the low magic talisman, it may be constructed at any time. Another similarity is that talismans should be charged during the waxing of the moon, amulets should be charged during the waning of the moon, but the time for the charging of the Kabbalistic talisman is far more precisely defined. The phases of the moon each last about two weeks. The Kabbalah moves down to a daily structure. Each day is associated with a planet. Monday is short for moon day. In French, the name of Tuesday is Mardi, the day of Mars. Tuz was the name of the European god who was equipped with the gods Mars. Similarly, the Northern Europeans' wooden day became Wednesday. In French, it is Mercury day, the day of Mercury. Thor's day became Thursday. Thor relates to the god Jupiter. In French, Jude means Jupiter's day and is the name for Thursday. Freya's day became Friday. In French, this is Vendredes or the day of Venus. Saturn's day and Sunday are obvious. Thus, we see that each day is associated with a planet. Monday with Moon, Tuesday with Mars, Wednesday with Mercury, Thursday with Jupiter, Friday with Venus, and Saturday with Saturn, and Sunday with Sun. If we are going to make a talisman associated with the Sephiroth, his head, and the planet Jupiter, it would make sense to charge this talisman on the day associated with that planet. Thursday. But there is more. For the charging of the Kabbalistic talisman gets even more precise than moving to a day of the week. We tend to think of our numerical system as being what is called base 10, a decimal system. This, however, has not always been the case. At one time, base 12 was very important and may have been the dominant mathematical system. There are still many remnants of base 12. There are special names for the first 12 numbers. After that, the numbers of combinations such as 3, 10, 13, 4, 10, 14, 25, 36, etc. There is no 110 or 210. Furthermore, there are 12 inches in a foot, not 10 inches. There are 12 months in a year, even though there are 13 lunar cycles. There are 12 constellations in the zodiacal belt, although more or less could have been chosen. As an example, the constellation Cetus, the whale, is within the zodiacal belt, but is ignored by most astrologers. The day is split into 24 hours. Dividing this in half, we find that there are two periods of 12 each, 12 hours each. It is logical to assume that there are 12 daylight hours and 12 darkness hours. While this is nice to assume on a theological basis, the unfortunate fact is that this precise 12 and 12 day only occurs twice during the year on the equinoxes. The ancient Kabbalists did divide the day into 24 hours and associated each hour with a planet. There have been several variations on the following lists, but I have found the one shown here, taken from the Greater Key of Solomon, to be the most accurate. See table page 346 through 347. This table of magical or planetary hours shows that each hour is associated with a planet. If you go back and look at the page of Kabbalistic Correspondences in Lesson 3, you will see that there are no planets associated with either Keter or Hokma. If you make a talisman associated with either of these two Sephiroth, it can be charged at any hour. Those talismans associated with either Sephiroth must be charged during the appropriate magic or planetary hour. It is important that you understand the comments under the table of planetary or magical hours. These magical hours are astronomical in nature and are not based upon the ticks or non-audible hum of common clocks. Planetary hours are not the same as our regularly 60-minute hours. Here are the steps to find out how long a planetary hour is. 1. Divide the number of minutes between sunrise and sunset by 12. This gives you the length of a daylight hour. 2. Subtract the number of minutes in a daylight magical hour from 120, the number of minutes in two regular hours. This gives you the number of minutes in a darkness magical hour. Example. Let's say that the sun rises at 5 a.m. and sets at 7 p.m. This gives us a daylight period of 14 hours, or multiply by 60 minutes per hour, 840 minutes, Divide this by 12, and we get a magical daylight hour of 70 minutes. This means that the first magical hour will run from 5 a.m. to 6, 10 a.m. 
The second will run from 6.10 a.m. to 7.20 a.m., etc., subtracting 70, the minutes in a daylight magical hour, from 120, the minutes, the number of minutes in two hours, you will see that a nighttime magical hour on this day lasts 50 minutes. Continuing with the above example, we can see that the first evening magical hour will last from 7 p.m. to 7.50 p.m. The second evening magical hour will run from 7.50 p.m. to 8.40 p.m., etc. Obviously, this entire process could be re reversed. You could determine the length of time from sunset to sunrise and divide it by 12 to first find the length of a nighttime magical hour. It will work both ways. The important thing to remember is that planetary hours are based on the length of time between sunset and sunrise, sunrise and sunset. They are not based on 60 minute hours. For some reason, many students seem to have difficulty working out the magical hours. Usually this lasts until they try to work out a set of magical hours for one day. If therefore the planetary hours are not clear to you right away, try working out a day or two. The sunrise and sunset times are listed in most daily newspapers in the weather section. Many sporting goods stores also have lists of these times. Magical or planetary hours are not the same as regular daily hours. Divide the total time between the sunrise and sunset by 12. This will give you the length of the magical hours of the day. Dividing the time by a tween, sunset and sunrise by 12 will give you the length of the planetary hours of the night. The hours of the day and night will be of different lengths except on the equinoxes. Times for charging Kabbalistic talismans. Best on the day and in the hour associated with the appropriate planet. Excellent on any day in the hour the appropriate planet. Not acceptable other times. Exceptions, Keter and Hochma, which are not associated with planets. Phases of the moon must be observed. In the last lesson, we designed a talisman for friendship, which was associated with the planet Sol, the sun. First, let me say that I do know that the sun is not what we would today consider a planet. However, the word planets means wanderer. These bodies in the skies, which moved faster than the slow turn of the stars, were considered to be wanderers or planets. Thus, since the sun and the moon appear to move faster than the backdrops of stars from our Earth-centered point of view, they are considered planets. The best time to charge this talisman would be on the day associated with the planet Sunday in the magical hour of the sun. But let us assume that today is Monday and we do not wish to wait for Sunday to come around to charge the talisman. Let us further assume that we wish to charge the talisman in the evening. We can see from the previous chart that on Monday the sun is related to the seventh magical hour after sunset. If we also go by the example given earlier, 50 minute magical evenings, hours, and sunset at 7 p.m., we can develop the following chart. So, on this particular Monday, the evening planetary hour of the sun does not come until the midnight hour. It may happen that this would not be a good time for us to do the ritual. Perhaps we may have to arise early in the morning and do not wish to stay up quite that late. On Tuesday evening, however, the planetary hour of the sun comes only four magical hours after sunset. Since the times would be very close with only a day difference, this will mean that on this particular Tuesday, the evening magical hour of the sun would last from about 9.30 to 10.20 p.m. with a few minutes difference at most. In this theoretical example, the Tuesday evening hour works out fine. So we decided to charge the talisman on Tuesday evening. Remember, a talisman itself is nothing but inert material. It must be achieved by the forces of higher planes and guides by your our will. Even if you go to an occult store and buy an expensive and frequently poorly or incorrectly made talisman, it is still inert until it is charged. The effect of the following ritual is to endo an inert and impotent thing with balanced motion in a given direction. The Simple Talisman Charging and Consecrating Ritual Part 1 1. Set up your altar as per your regular ritual practice. 2. Put on your altar the talisman ready to be charged. A. It should already have been designed and constructed. B. According to the moon's phase, it should be deemed a talisman or amulet. C. A bag to hold it, such as already described, should lie next to the talisman on the altar. D. A divination must 
have been done to determine the outcome of the magical operation, and E, a word or short phrase should be determined to represent the talisman. 3. You should take a ritual cleansing bath as previously described in this course. Part 2. At the appropriate hour in the case of our example, the hour of the sun, begin the ritual with the following. 1. The relaxation ritual. 2. The lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. 3. The banishing ritual of the hexagram. 4. The middle pillar ritual. Do not do the circulation of the body of light. Part 3. 1. Change the energy flowing through you as a result of the middle pillar ritual by the use of your imagination and will to the color of the appropriate sephiroth. In the case of ours, the example would use pure gold or yellow. 2. Pick up the talisman and hold it between your hands. Direct the energy controlled in the middle pillar down your arms into your hands and thus into the talisman. Feel it flow. 3. Say. A. Come, O, oh, vibrate the name of the angelic order. Servants to God, surround, consecrate, and charge this talisman. Revibrate the name of the angelic order. Or B. O. Oh, vibrate the name of the archangel. Help thy humble servant and consecrate and charge this talisman. Revibrate the name of the archangel. Or C. I invoke the power of. Vibrate God name. Charge and consecrate this talisman for thy name's sake. Revibrate God name. In our example, the name of the angelic order is Malchim. And the archangel is Raphael. The God name is yud heh vav -Heh, Elohim av -Da -At. These can be found on the first list of Kabbalistic correspondences. I hope you are beginning to see just how important the page of information is. 4. Using the predetermined word or short phrase, say out loud the purpose of the talisman. 5. Hold the talisman flat in your left hand. Pick up the rainbow wand by the end of the color associated with the planet with which you are working. To do this, you must know which planet is said to rule which sign. Aries, Mars, Taurus, Venus, Gemini, Mercury, Cancer, Moon, Leo, Sun, Virgo, Mercury, more practical than Gemini, Libra, Venus, Scorpio, Mars, Energy and Instability, Sagittarius, Jupiter, Capricorn, Saturn, Outgoing, Seeking, Change. Aquarius, Saturn, erratic, revolutionary energy. Pisces, Jupiter, easily changeable, kind, receptive. As you can see, some of the planets have dual rulership over the signs. In the above chart, you are given the information necessary to decide which band of the rainbow one to hold. In our example, you would hold the yellow band, the band associated with the sign of Leo, which is ruled by the sun. Holding the rainbow wand by the appropriate band, make an invoking earth pentagram over the talisman. This pentagram should not be made horizontally but vertically, like the pentagrams in the LBRP, but smaller. You will find that your wand is horizontal parallel to the earth. The black end of the rainbow wand should be slightly lower than the white end. It should never be higher than the white end. If you have not as yet constructed your rainbow wand, or if it is an emergency, and you do not have your rainbow wand handy, you can use the blade with which you performed the LBRP or your right index finger. 6. Now inhale and thrust the black end of the rainbow wand, dagger, or finger at the center of the pentagram you have formed while you exhale the vibrate. The appropriate god name, in the case of our example, it is yud heh vav -Heh, elo av da -At. 7. Repeat step 5 and 6 to total the number of sephiroth with which the talisman is associated. In our example, we would perform step 5 and 6 for a total of 6 times, 6 being the number of Teferet. 8. Say firmly and meaningfully, so mote it be. 9. Place the talisman in the container you have preferred, prepared for. Part 4. 1. Perform the banishing ritual of the hexagram. 2. Perform the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. The ritual is complete. Notes. 1. Before doing a any gray magic, such as talismanic magic, always do a divination, such as with tarot cards, to learn if it is a good idea to do this magic. 2. You can charge several talismans for the same purpose at the same time, 
but you should not try to charge several talismans for different purposes at the same time. 3. Keep the talisman on your person or very close to you at all times with a string you can make the bag which contains a talisman into a pendant on a necklace if you are giving a talisman another person. A. Ask their permission to do the magic for them. B. Have that person keep the talisman near or on his or her body. 4. Destroy the talisman. Burn and throw the ashes to the wind or place them in running water or bury them once it has achieved its intended purpose. If you see a limit on the talisman, destroy it at the end of the time limit even if it has not as yet achieved its goal. This form of magic is quite solitary in nature. Obviously, nobody else is necessary to allow you to perform the charging and consecration of a talisman. However, this simple talisman charging and consecration ritual does make a wonderful and powerful group right. Rather than repeating the whole ritual, I am just going to give you notes on how the ritual magic can be turned into ceremonial magic. 1. Everyone in the group should be informed of the purpose of the talisman. They all should be together when the divination is performed. 2. All present should take ritual baths. 3. If there is a leader, that person should sit in the east unless the leader is the person charging the talisman. 4. The LBRP and BRH should be performed by the group as described earlier in this course. 5. All present should do the middle pillar ritual. 6. When the person doing the charging feels everyone is together, hint, try the synchronized breathing. He or she should tell everyone to charge the pure white energy of the middle pillar to the color associated with this talisman. 7. Let the person doing the charging direct everyone else to send the energy down their arms and into him or her, the person doing the actual charging. When the person doing the ritual senses the energy, that person should recite the invocations. However, all person should vibrate the name of the angelic order, the archangel, and the god name. 8. This idea is continued when doing the invoking earth pentagram. All present should vibrate the god name. By the way, the purpose of this part of this ritual is to bring into the earth's plane. Hence, the invoking earth pentagram, the energies from higher planes. 9. All presents should be inside the magical circle. No interested bystanders remaining outside the circle should be allowed. 10. Either the BRH and the LBRP may be repeated at the end of the ritual or the leader of the group, not necessarily one doing the ritual, may come before the altar and say, I thank all ye creatures who have watched and joined in our ritual. Return now to your abodes and habitations and harm none on your way. Let there be peace between thee and we. May the blessings of vibrate Yehashuha Yehovavsha as you are able to receive thy them be upon thee. The leader then taps the altar or ground with the bottom black end of the rainbow one ten times in a three four three pattern and says, I now declare this temple duly closed. 11. If desired, the BRH and LBRP plus the leader's closing may be used. But unless there are unusual circumstances, such as the atmosphere feeling very crowded with energy or entities, both are not necessary. Part 3 One of the famous stories concerning S.L. McGregor Mathers, a founder and driving force behind the Golden Dawn, concerns peas. It seems that he had some enemies within the order, and he wished to get rid of them. So he took some peas and baptized them with the same names as the people of whom he wished to be free. Then he swirled them in a sieve with the idea being that as the peas went down to the sieve, so too would his enemies have a downfall. Several people I know who claim to be occultists have made fun of Mathers over this. They felt that Mathers, the head and guide of the Golden Dawn, should have used ceremonial magic techniques and not what seems like low magic it is certainly possible that the exact details of Mather's actions were incorrectly reported or misinterpreted. Because I doubt that Mathers would have let any uninitiated persons watch him perform the ritual, isn't it possible that Mathers or the initiated person reporting this episode use expressions such as peas, baptize, and sieve as a trap to non-initiates? 
Initiates would be able to figure out that these were code words for other ideas, and non-initiates would have a small idea of magical processes. I think that this is not only possible, but likely. I have talked before about the meaning of initiation and wish to bring it up again. In most initiations, the candidate is blindfolded, brought into a new and unfamiliar situation, and then taught about his or her new surroundings. This is similar in nature to the birth process. First, everything is dark. Then you are thrust into a new situation about which you need to learn. Initiation is a type of rebirth. In fact, some occultists claim, much to the consternation of Christian fundamentalists, that when the Bible discusses being born again, what is really being discussed is the idea of initiation. What is baptism, if it is not an initiation into a particular religion? Did not, according to the Bible, Jesus tell his inner group of initiates that some things they would understand, but to the masses he must speak in parables? One function of initiation is that of being born a second time into a new, more spiritual way of life. Any valid initiation ritual has this quality. You may wish to look at some books with initiation rituals in them to see whether or not this is correct. I feel that it is possible that in the story about Mathers, peas were used as a code name for talismans. Baptize could be a code word for initiate and sieve, a code word for the process of focusing mind power. Admittedly, this is just speculation. But if it is correct, what Mathers was doing would be strictly Golden Dawn style ceremonial magic. An initiation or baptism can give a person a new or second life. Does it not follow that something inert, something without a life force, can be given a life force, can be born for the first time and given life by the initiation process? The Golden Dawn believes so, and as a result of my personal experience, I agree. On the next few pages, I will be giving a complete ritual for the charging and consecration of a talisman. It will be your longest ritual to date and may take up to two hours to perform, although one to one and a half is more the norm. So before starting, I want to show you how it works and describe the various sections of the ritual. First, of course, are the preparations. This means planning out the ritual, gathering all the necessary tools, designing and constructing the talisman, doing the divination, preparing the area and yourself, cleansing setting up the temple, etc. This should all be finished just before the start of the appropriate magical hour. The second phase of this ritual is the watchtower ritual. This should take at least 20 minutes by itself. Phase three is not done in the simple talisman charging and consecration ritual. In this phase, you enleaven, you actually give a form of life to the talisman via an abbreviated initiation ritual. Phase 4 includes charging the talisman by names and symbols of the appropriate cosmic forces of being. Phase 5 is the empowering of the talisman by force of will to a specific goal. Finally, Phase 6 concludes the ritual with the closing by Watchtower as described earlier in this course. Most rituals reach their highest peak of effectiveness when they are memorized. Thus, memorizing the LBRP, the middle pillar, and the circulation of the body of light, the BRH, and the Rose Cross ritual, makes them better and more effective for most forms of gray magic. Memorization is impractical. Thus, it is a good idea to make up note cards with writing big enough so that you can read the words of the ritual. I use a music stand to support an 8.5 by 11 inch cardstock sheets for the purpose. Thin sheets of paper tend to slip and fall down. You may wish to do something similar. If your magical hour is only 15 minutes long, how can you fit a two-hour ritual into it? The answer is that phases one, two, and three can be done just before the start of the magical hour. Phases four and five must occur within the designated planetary hour for the greatest effectiveness. Thus, phase six may occur after the end of the planetary or magical hour. As you follow through this ritual, you will find nothing difficult for, nor unusual with perhaps one exception. At various times, you will see the words ad lib. This means that at these sections, you are to freely add whatever words or actions you deem appropriate. This is not as hard as it might sound, especially if you have been practicing the teachings of this course so far. For example, let us assume that there was an invocation followed by the words ad lib. Here is an example, just pulled off the top of my head, which would be appropriate. O oh my Lord Adonai, thou hast permit me to venture this far into the temple of thine mysteries. By thy glory do not deny your servant now. 
Fill this talisman with thy presence for thy name's sake, not mine. For to thee this kingdom of the power of the glory until eternity fades to nothing, as no mote it be. It does not have to be long, although it may be. It may seem stilted or artificial, yet it is still a good idea to dress it up with pseudo-old English. This serves the same function as does putting on of the robe. The robe indicates that you are not doing everyday things. The affected speech shows that you are not talking with your next-door neighbor. Finally, the most important part of these ad-lib sections is that they must be from your heart and be meaningful and deeply felt. Otherwise, they are useless phrases, about as attractive to the gods as are dead flowers to us mortals. The Complete Ritual for Charging and Consecrating a Talisman Part 1. The Preparation Begins by physically cleansing your working area. It has a hard floor wash if it has a hard floor wash it, or at least vacuum. If you have a negative ion generator or device which rids the air of dust particles, leave it on in your working area for a few hours before cleansing with vacuum and slash or water. Wash and polish all your magical tools too. If you have some nice music you can play in the background while you do the physical preparations, it would be nice. Gentle New Age music, especially those pieces without strong rhythms or standard harmonies, are appropriate. The whole of these preparations should not to be thought of in terms of work. Rather, you should think of these things in terms of getting dressed to go out on a Saturday night. While doing this physical cleaning, you should direct your thoughts to clearing the area of all unwanted or negative influence. Once this physical cleaning has been completed, set up your work area so that it becomes your temple. Place appropriately colored candles around so that you will have enough light. However, since you will be leaving the area for a while, don't light them yet. If there is even a remote possibility of flame or dripping wax, starting a fire, have all of your tools on the altar, and most appropriately, have your already constructed talisman and a holder bag for it on the altar, too. Make sure you have your instructions for the ritual close by. When you have completed the above work, go to the doorway of the room, which contains your prepared temple, and look the room over. If it is as perfectly prepared as possible, spend a moment congratulating yourself on a job well done. Then take a deep breath, and as you exhale, say, Thank you, O Lord, Grand Architect of the Universe, for thy permission to construct this temple as a tiny pale echo of thy greater creation. May thy blessings fall upon it, for the name's sake, so mote it be. Then close the door so that nobody else can enter the room. Lock the door if necessary. Note that beside asking for the grace of divinity upon the temple, we are also calling the temple a small version of the entirety of the universe, the microcosm to the macrocosm of the cosmos, as below, so above. In this way, the altar becomes the exact center of the universe and meeting place of the balance and harmony for all elemental and planetary forces. The next step is to disconnect the telephone so that its ring will not disturb you. If you live with other people and cannot do this, tell them you do not wish to be disturbed by the next few hours, and should the phone ring and be for you, ask them to please take a message. Finally, take a ritual cleansing bath as already described. When finished, put on your ritual robe or special clothes reserved for ritual work. If you have any special magical jewelry, now is the time to put it on, too. As you put on your garments and jewelry, say, Blessed art thou, O Lord, maker of the universe, whom usest thy universe as but a footstool for thou hast allowed me to don the robes of the magical art or say something similar ad lib upon completion of your ritual bath and donning of the robe it should be the time to enter your temple by this i mean it should be the start of the appropriate magical planetary hour or early enough so that the important body of the ritual will take place in the time frame it is too early if it is too early, it is okay to enter the temple, but you should not begin the ritual. Rather, you should sit in quiet contemplation until the correct beginning time. Think about what you're going to do in a few minutes. Consider the months and hours you have put into practicing the rituals, doing the spiritual exercises, and earning yourself the right to do the ritual, and you will be performing shortly. And of course, also think about the awe and majesty of the divine sources of all. Finally, everything will be ready. You will have already done a divination, the temple is prepared, the talisman is prepared, the phase of the moon is correct, the ritual you would do is written down so that you will not err, and most importantly, you are ready to begin. For part two, the banishing and balancing. Perform the watchtower ritual opening. This ritual has the effect of spiritually purifying the temple. It is the astral equivalent to your earlier physical cleansing. 
is also has the purpose and effect of balancing the magical elemental forces. Thus, upon completion of the Watchtower ritual, your altar becomes a focus of a perfectly balanced influx of energy from all of the magical elements. Therefore, take your time and do this ritual well. Part 3. Enlivening and Consecrating the Talisman Step 1. While keeping yourself inside your magical circle, place the talisman outside the circle between the south and west. Go to the altar, altar and pick up the rainbow wand by the colored stripe appropriate to this magical working with your left hand. Take the dagger used in the LBRP in your right hand. Go to the southwest side of the circle. Always remember to walk clockwise in your temple unless there are specific instructions to do otherwise. Face outwards towards where the talisman lies and cross your hands in front of you and say that your magical tools form an X, blocking entry into the circle. Say, before I entered this magical circle, I was alive yet not alive. Once said, I have been born anew. So too are all things outside this circle without true spiritual life. Hear now, O talisman, amulet if appropriate, that thou mayest enter, but may not move on. If you prefer, this declaration may be done ad lib. Step 2. Using the tip of the dagger, draw the talisman into the magical circle and say, Now, O creature of talismans, become a dwelling place of purpose of talisman, and be thou a body for the magical magnificence of name of Sephiroth associated with this talisman. Part 3. Pick up the talisman and place it at the foot of the altar so that it is between you and the altar when you face east. Both you and the talisman are west of the altar, and say, in the name of vibrate appropriate god name and be all the power and forces invoked here this night day if done during daylight i proclaim that i say your magical name shall invoke thee to form a true and potent link between my human soul and that spirit of give word telling purpose of talisman summed up in the name of vibrate the name of sephiroth appropriately to this end i have formed and perfected this talisman element amulet if appropriate bearing the necessary seals sigils and symbols i proclaim that this talisman amulet shall be charged in order that state purpose of talisman may be my mine so that i may be enabled to perform the great work and be better able to assist humanity may the powers of vibrate appropriate sephiroth witness this my solemn pledge step four Pick up the talisman and place it in the center of the top of the altar. Put the dagger on the altar and hold the rainbow wand by the white band color and say, I now invoke the powers of vibrate name of Sephiroth into this temple in the name of vibrate God name. Be here now. Know that all ends in readiness to consecrate this talisman amulet. Aid me with thy power that I may cause the great archangel vibrate the name of appropriate archangel to give life and strength to this creature of talisman in the name of vibrate god name. Step 5. Put the rainbow wand down on the altar and pick up the dagger using the LBRP. Now move east of the altar and face west. As you go through the following speech, draw the appropriate figures as you drew them on the talisman in the air with the dagger. They should be drawn over the talisman. Visualize them in bright blue, flecked with shimmering gold. Say, I invoke the powers of, vibrate name, and draw it in the air. Bring, state of purpose, to this talisman, amulet. By the power of, name planet and draw symbol of it, I invoke, state purpose, into this talisman, amulet. By this symbol, draw a symbol you use such as from the system of AO square. I invoke state purpose into this talisman or amulet. Repeat this type of invocation ad lib until you have drawn each and every symbol which is on your talisman. Feel free to turn the talisman over and open it up so that you can see the symbols and words as you draw them into the air. Now move back to the west of the altar and face east. Step six, put down the dagger, pick up the cup, sprinkle the talisman with a few drops of water after dipping your fingers in the cup and say i purify this water if the ink might run sprinkle toward the talisman but not on it now pick up the incense and wave it over the talisman and say i consecrate with fire 
Now pick up the talisman in your left hand and the dagger from the LBRP. Tap the talisman three times with the tip of the dagger's blade. Next, hold the talisman and dagger point up above your head and stomp your feet left foot between the following broken words. So, step moat, step it, step B, step. Finally, knock slowly three times on the altar with the hilt of the dagger. Step 7. Still holding the talisman and dagger, move in a clockwise direction and walk around, circumbobulate the altar once and continue until you just go past the, se- past the south and say, Unpurified and unconsecrated, thou canst not enter the gate of the west. Put the talisman on the ground and, always moving in a clockwise direction, go to the altar. Place the dagger down and bring the cup to the talisman. Dip your fingers in the water and sprinkle a few drops of water on or towards the talisman while saying, I purify the water. Go to the altar and replace the cup. Take the incense and bring it to the talisman. As you wave it over, the talisman say, I consecrate it with fire. Go to the altar and replace the incense. Pick up the dagger and return to the talisman, which you also pick up in your left hand. Say, creature of talismans, amulet. Twice purified and twice consecrated, thou mayest approach the gateway of the west. Now move to the west and look out in that direction. Tap talismans once with the tip of the blade of the dagger and say, Before thou canst come into the light, thou must first come out of the darkness. Yet fear not the darkness of the west, for there is no place that God and the light of God are not. Therefore take on manifestation before me without fear. For in the west is he in whom fear is not, and now that thou knowest this truth, pass thou on. Step 8. Circumbobulate the circle once, then go around again until you just pass the north, and say, Unpurified and unconsecrated thou canst not enter the path of the east. As in step 7, purify with water and consecrate with fire, saying the appropriate phrases. Then pick up the talisman in your left hand, your right hand has a dagger, and say, Consecrate of talismans, amulets, thrice purified and thrice consecrated, thou mayest approach the gateway of the east. Move to the east and face outward in that direction, hold the talisman and dagger on high and say, To become a talisman amulet strong and true, thou must pass from darkness into light, from death into life. To do this requires a light which shines from within the darkness, though the darkness comprehendeth it not. By the will of God I can control a speck of that light which ariseth in darkness. I am the exorcist in the midst of the exorcism. Therefore, take on manifestation before me, for I am the wielder of the forces of balance. Now pass thou on to the double cubical altar of the universe. Step 9. Return to the west of the altar and face east. With the dagger used in the LBRP, redraw all the symbols and sigils drawn on the talisman as done earlier. Repeat, too, the ad lib invocations, only end by saying, Thus do I potentially conjure and exercise thee. Quickly put down the dagger and pick up the rainbow wand by the appropriate band in your right hand. Hold both the wand and the talisman on high and cry out, Creature of talismans, long hast thou dwelt in the darkness of unlife. Quite the night and seek the day. Step 10. Place the talisman back on the altar and hold the rainbow wand vertically over it. Say, by all the names, powers, and rituals already rehearsed, recited, and performed, I conjure upon thee power and might, irrestible, cobs unpacked, knocks unpox, light in extinction, as the light hidden in darkness can manifest therefrom, so shalt thou become irrestible. Now hold the rainbow wand in front of you in step 11 and perform the middle pillow ritual. Begin to cycle the energy through you down the front as you exhale and up the back on the inhalation as in the ritual of the circulation of the body of light. When you feel the energy flowing, make the sign of the enterer as in the LBRP, but toward the talisman resting on the altar, your right hand should hold a rainbow wand on the appropriate color 
with your index finger pointing along the wand so that the wand becomes an extension of your arm and hand. As you give this sign, look down your arms directly at the talisman. Know that this ritual gesture is also known as the projecting sigil or the projecting sign and that you are projecting the energy raised in the middle pillar and controlled in the circulation of the body of light. Feel it flow down your arms and out of you since it congeal within the talisman. At the same time, watch the talisman. When you see a twinkle of light or a slight movement of the sigils on the talisman, it will be charged. Step 12. Immediately stand straight up, tap the black end of the rainbow wand three times on the floor and say it is done. Step 13. Now hold your hands in the air. The rainbow wand is in your right hand and say, let the white brilliance of the divine spirit descend upon this creature of talisman, amulet, and fill it with the glory of thy majesty that it may be unto me as an aid to aspire to the great work. Draw an invoking earth pentagram with the rainbow wand in the air over the talisman. See it in bright blue. Say, glory be unto thee, Lord of the land of life, for thy splendor flows out rejoicing even to the ends of the universe. Step 14. Pick up the talisman in your left hand and hold it so it can be seen from outside the circle. Circumbobulate around the circle while saying, Behold all powers and forces that are here in attendance. I am pure, I am pure, I am pure. Take witness that I have duly exercised, purified, initiated, unveiled, consecrated, and empowered this creature of talismans, amulets, by the power of stop, vibrate name of planet, and form sign of the planet in the air with the rainbow wand, then continue on. With the aid of stop vibrate and draw the god name and by the exaltation of my own higher nature step 15 return to the west of the altar and face east place the talisman in the center of the altar pick up the dagger air dagger touch the tip of the blade to the talisman and say by the powers of air replace the dagger and touch the earth pentacle to the talisman say and of earth. Replace the pentacle and touch the fire wand to the talisman and say, and of fire. Put down the fire wand and sprinkle some water from the elemental cup on or towards the talisman and say, and of water. Put down the cup and pick up the rainbow wand by the right band. Hold it on high and say, and by the secret names of the divine presence who works in silence and whom not be but silence can express, I declare, by my rights earned, by my practice of the arts, magical, that this talisman amulet is charged and consecrated, so mote it be. Step 16. Put the talisman in the bag which you have prepared it for, place it on your person, whether it for you or not, and say, not unto me, but unto thee, by the power and glory forever and ever and even beyond the ends of time. I thank thee for allowing me to enter even thus far into the temple of thine divine mysteries. Or you may add lib appropriately. Part 4. The Banishings Perform the closing by watchtower. This ritual is now complete. All the rules concerning what to do with the talismans after they have achieved their goal or have exceeded their time limit apply to those talismans charged with this ritual as well. Until you break down all the tappings of their area, it is still a temple and should be treated as such. Until you put everything away, be sure to walk clockwise in your temple. The end of the ritual does not end in the spiritual qualities of the area. You will have noticed that the phases of this ritual, has, as mentioned earlier, do not easily match the parts of this ritual. This is because the phases overlap and do not occur in seclusion and is isolated from the other phases. Part of the preparation for a gray magic ritual is total understanding of that ritual. Before performing this ritual, you should study it so that you can spot where each of the phrases takes place and how they interpenetrate each other. Before going on to the next lesson in this book, I strongly urge the following. 1. Design and create at least two talismans. Charge and consecrate one by way of the simple ritual and one by the way of the complete ritual. You can do more if you like. 
to spend some time reading at least one book in the tarot. Look especially for philosophical books rather than how to give reading books. The bibliography for this lesson lists several of my favorites. In the next lesson, I will explain how to work with the grimoires. These are some of the most famous and magical texts. Unfortunately, many of them are either incomplete, such as the Arbitel of Magic, are questionable, such as the Necronomicon, are too time-consuming, such as Abremulin, or are too rare and expensive. Therefore, I will be basing the lesson on two texts which are reasonably priced and available at many occult bookstores. The books are The Greater Key of Solomon and The Goetia, which is a section of The Lesser Key of Solomon. Both are available in more than one edition, and any edition will do since they are virtually copies of each other. If you can obtain these two books, I have talked often about how most self-professed magicians talk a great deal but do nothing. I know many people who have the lesser and the greater keys and have looked through them but have never practiced the rituals or techniques which are within them. There are many reasons for this, but the primary three reasons are based on fear and egotism. 1. They don't have enough knowledge to do them. They are afraid that if they seek out that knowledge that they will learn just how little they know and expose themselves for nothing but being the great occultists they claim to be. In quotation marks. 2. They fear the rituals and don't even wish to try them. Even worse, they are afraid of what might happen if they are successful and cannot control the powers that they summon. 3. They are afraid that if they try them and then fail, it will show that they are not as good as they claim to be, or it will prove to them that magic is fake and they have wasted years of their lives in its study. Again, if you do not own these books, I urge you to obtain them. Everything you will need to try out some of the rituals we printed in the next lesson, but these books give advanced information along the lines of the Kabbalistic correspondence charts. They give lists of powers of entities who are appropriate to deal with when seeking to obtain certain items or qualities. If you have these books or if you obtain them soon, do not try any of the rituals before going through the next lesson. You can't get hurt like so many seem to fear, but you will be wasting your time. The next lesson will include the information you need, which makes the grimoires workable. Furthermore, these books deal with magical invocation and bringing the visible appearance entities from higher levels of reality. Back in the beginning of this course, I told you that you would not be summoning anything up. How, then, can something be evoked to physical appearance without summoning it up? I promise you that you will learn all this and more. You will learn the true secrets of magical invocation as you will see that the rituals and the grimoires are the first which are easier to do in groups and harder, but not impossible to do by yourself. Virtually pure ceremonial magic.